Exodus 33, with verse 1 to 17. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, and you the people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I saw to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to, you, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out all the ites. So there's Canaanites and all those ites. Okay. Yeah. And he says, go up to the land flowing from milk and honey. Then he says, remember this is now Exodus 33. So the people that have been traveling for quite a while, for 33 chapters, they've been traveling. So here, right at the, towards the end of Exodus 33, look what, what the Bible says. God says, go up to the land flowing from milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Afrikaans, there's a word, hardekwas. Okay, you are a stiff-necked people. I read this and I thought maybe it's a mistake and I read it again. So Moses went to the people, verses four to six. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So, so now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves from their ornaments from Mount Horeb onwards. When I read this, I almost saw the humanity of God. It's almost like you that had teenagers in your house. At some point in time you say, I can't deal with this now. Just put your cell phone away, put it in that drawer, and go to your room. In a way, I sense this. <laughs> Thank you. That God said to Moses, you know what Moses, we came 33 chapters. For 33 chapters, I fed the nation. I gave them what they need. And we still need to sort out the same old issue. Moses, I'm really up to here. That is my translation. And sometimes we think when we feel like that, it's not godly. I've got news for you. It's not godly with you when you would respond and you step out of character. But, but even God said, listen Moses, stop here. Take these people away. Let me just think what I'm going to do from here. But what I think now is I don't think I'm going to go with you. That is what he says to Moses. So, so Moses has this dilemma. Remember where Moses comes from. Moses, you know the story of Moses? He actually grew up in a king's house. And he was called to lead people. Can you remember the story of Moses? When Moses was called, he said to God, but, 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 but I can't speak properly. Remember, he was stuttering. And then the Lord said, okay, well, bring your brother. So Moses had all these excuses because he didn't want to be in the position where he is right now. He never saw himself as somebody that's going to lead God's people um, into the promised land. So he never saw himself. He never saw him uh, doing that. He never saw himself as a leader. And he also didn't f feel equipped to do so. So he's in a position where he didn't want to be. He's actually in a dilemma. Because right now he's here, he brought people from where they were suffering, but at least they had to eat. Even the, 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 the Israelites at some point in time said, Moses, at least we had a roof over our head and we had something to eat. Now you bring us out here. So he brought people from where they were. He's got this promise to take them into a new land, but somewhere in the middle he's stuck because he didn't want to be there and he has people that do not want to work with them. Now in a way, when we think of a new year and an old year, sometimes we, <laughs> in a way, also are stuck in that, can I say, dilemma. We come from where we 
No, we, we were familiar and comfortable. And in a way, we need to move into a new year and it's new territory. And where we are, we feel inadequate, we feel incompetent. And I think, can I say, I don't think God's intention was ever to leave and to let the, the, um, the Israelites go into the promised land on their own. I think this was a test of character for Moses. Now, I'm putting myself in Moses' shoes. If it was me, maybe my temperament would have said, okay, you know what, then I'll do it on my, on my terms. If, if I need to do this alone, then I'll sort them out. So Israelites, you come here, you a troublemaker, you a troublemaker, you stay behind, I take these, let's pick new leaders, who's with me, who's again? That's, that would probably be me trying to organize because it is most now on me. So I'll, I have to make a plan. My wife calls me Mr. Fix-It. So sometimes, so many, we married for 30 years and she, she would come to me and she would pour her heart out and all she wants me is just to hold her. And then I take note of everything she says because now I'm gonna fix it. And then she said to me, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. So I think my temperament would have been to make a list of all the wrongs and try and fix it. But you know what Moses did? Let's read from verse seven to verse 17. Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp, a distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, the people would rise up at their tent door and watch until Moses had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak to Moses. When the people saw the pillar of cloud, all the people would worship each at their tent door. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Something happened. I do not read that God said to Moses, Moses, you're in a dilemma. Go and put a tent and find my will and my plan. It was something that Moses did out of his heart. He was at a place and a point where he said, I can now only turn to God. And whether he did this by force or by choice, he went and he, he pitched the tent. Can you see God's faithfulness? God didn't say, if you pitch a tent, I'll show my presence through this, what do they call it, um, a cloud. Um, sorry, there was a, there was a, a, a light, I see my spirit eye, a light beam that's standing by the tent. God never said to him, listen, let's sort this out. You pitch a tent. You know what? When you enter that tent, I'll show my presence and the people will see. And then they will align. I don't read this. But I read the response of a loving God on a act of faithfulness. Do you see that? And sometimes when we at that point, I don't have all the promises from God, I don't have the ABCs, but I do know that if I turn to him, he will respond. He doesn't need to prove himself or to reassure me, but he still does that. And here he demonstrated himself in such a way that nobody could argue that Moses spent time with the living God. Do you see that? Do you hear that? This morning I want to shout it out and say so many times when we in a dilemma, we do so many things and we think it's on us. It's not on us. We just need to show an act of faithfulness, an act of obedience, an act of submission, and God will answer in a way where others will see and recognize him. I don't think Moses, when he was there in the tent, when he spoke to God face to face, actually thought about the cloud or the pillar. He didn't think, but everybody else saw it, and immediately it restored his position in that nation. Do you see that? 
Moses also spoke to the Lord in verse 12. So I, I, I thought to myself, how would this discussion be in the tent? Would it be Moses on his face and just say, Listen, Lord, I'm listening, I'm listening. But the Bible says, God speak to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And this is what Moses says. He says, Lord, you brought me up or you, you, you bring me up this people. He said, actually said, Lord, you know what? This that I'm facing now is actually not what I wanted. You brought me here. He's, he's complaining in the presence of God. He says, you have not sent me somebody to help me and yet you said that you know, um, th that you know be the name that I found favor in your sight. He actually says, this is God, you asked me to do something. You didn't even give me something, somebody to help me. I'm alone. He's still complaining. Now, just on that, I, I value, I value a mentor, a coach, and the input of a person in my life. So number one, what Moses did, he was an act of obedience, he turned to God. But he also said to God, God, I realize that, that I battle alone. So just reassure me that there's going to be somebody that's walking with me. So this morning, maybe I'm jumping, but, but just hear me out. You need, first of all, to be in alignment with God, but second of all, you have to have that somebody that you can call, that you can speak to, somebody that knows you inside out, somebody that you're not ashamed just to share the good, the bad, and the ugly, somebody that you trust. So I want to encourage you, even Moses said, God, you, you need to send me somebody. And then he says, if that is so, show me your way that I might know you and find favor in your sight. And just by the way, Lord, remember, these are your people. <laughs> he says, Lord, show me your way. I know I've moaned. I know I've complained. But show me your way that I'll find favor in your sight. And by the way, this problem is not mine. <laughs> With all respect, Lord, this is, this is your problem. I, I hope you hear me. This is what Moses said in that tent of meeting. So where we stand now, 21, 22, we're actually at a time where we reflect. And whether we consciously do it or not, we all go through this process. We think of 2021, even this morning when we spoke to people, people say, you know what, we hope it's going to we trust it's going to be better in 22 than 21 because we have a framework of 21. We have a reference on how it was. We remember our challenges. We remember the sore. We remember the hurt. Some of it we caused. Some of it we received. But we remember that. And we stand here and we have a hope that 2022 will be different. Now, Einstein said, if you want a different outcome, you cannot keep doing the same. So where we have time to reflect and we say, but I don't want 2022 to be like 21, then something must change. You have to have something different to have a different result. I went and I looked at New Year's resolutions because that's normally the result. We look at 2021 and it's now the second day of 2021 and if you said I'm gonna jog, if, if I said from 2022 I'm gonna jog every morning, then I've already missed two mornings <laughs> because it's not happening, okay. I looked at New Year's resolutions and I wonder if you can help me. Uh, there was a census. What is the top New Year's resolution? The one number one on the list of 10. Okay, I'll turn sideways. What is the top resolution? To, to lose weight. I thought you were going to say build more muscle. No, you're right. 
Number one New Year's resolution is I'm going to lose weight. All right. That is why the gym contracts goes through the roof. This is why game and outdoor wear sells thousands of bicycles in the first year or two, uh, first week or two of the new year. Okay. Number two. What do you think was the second New Year's resolution? Okay, I'll help you. Quit smoking. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, preach, I'm just saying that was number two. Number three. Learn something new. I thought, okay, that is remarkable. Okay, that was the third. Number four, eat healthy and go on a diet. Number five, get out of debt and save money. Number six, spend more time with my family. Number seven, travel to new places. With COVID, yeah, okay, travel to new places. Number eight, be less stressed. So people have this new re resolution, I'm going to be less stressed. Okay, you have to do something about it then. Number nine, which I like, volunteer more. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good one. Maybe, maybe we can take that out of the nine. Maybe we can volunteer more in the new year. And number 10, drink less. So I don't think they refer to coffee, okay, because I think coffee is fine, but drink less. So... We are busy reflecting, and we consider now. And now is a time where we think inwards, because we cannot change 2021, and we are hopeful for 2022. So we think inwards. It was, um, where's my notes? I think it was Billy Graham that said, there's two good things about New Year's resolutions. Number one, at least you're honest with yourself. Because if you make a New Year's resolution to start losing weight, at least for once, you're honest about your weight. And number two, as you go on the journey, you realize you cannot do it on your own. He says, that's the that's two good things about New Year's resolutions. So I... I don't know what is our resolution. I can't even tell you what's mine. For the past few years, my New Year's resolution was just finish what you've started the last five years. I've got a list of things to do. And when I get tired with the list and I'm about 80% with some of those projects, then I start a new one just to energize again. So I've got quite a few 70, 60, 50% projects that I need to finish. I don't know what is your New Year's resolution. But I want to take us back to what Moses did. He was also at a point where he reflected. And look at the first thing that he did. Um, if we say considering now, Moses pitched a tent of meeting. To me, meeting says that I'm making an appointment with somebody. If you have Outlook and fancy electronic diaries, you go to it and you click and you open up an hour with that person. So the, in, the, the tent of meeting was an intention of engagement. He did that because he said, I need to spend time with God so that I can hear him, see him and experience him. So to me, a tent of meeting says, let's, let's engage. Number two, when we have that appointment, what do we do in meetings? Do we just sit and listen? No, we speak and we listen. So in this meeting, this, this engagement that we commit ourselves to, let's speak. Moses did that. Lord, by the way, it's your people. You didn't even send somebody. Speak, but also listen. If I'm in a meeting and I never listen, people will at some point in time shut me up and say, listen, just listen, listen, listen. And then I set up a meeting with the understanding that when we walk from there, there will be some consensus either with tasks 
or decisions. Now, when we make an appointment in our Christian walk, our spiritual life, and we can set up a meeting, don't you think that will change so many things? Where I say, Lord, that is my time. Maybe it's Monday this week, it's Tuesday next week, or it's eight o'clock this morning, or it's four o'clock this afternoon, or four o'clock in the morning. But Lord, I want to engage with you. I want to hear, I want to listen, and I want to get confirmation, assurance, consensus. What do we do from here? Number one, Moses pitched the tent. Number two, he said to God, you sent me. What does it mean to me? When I'm in that tent, I can say to God, God, I know that there's a calling and there's a purpose on my life. You brought me to here. I trust that you'll also take me to where you want to be. If I'm in that tent, number three, I can say, Lord, I really don't know how, and I don't know with whom, but also show me who I can trust and who can journey with me. Number five, let me find favor in your sight. In other words, let me position myself in a way that I'll find favor. As I said, we, we had a time where we reflect. And maybe to make that decision to pitch a tent of meeting is one thing. But I think sometimes we're not too sure what to do when we're in the presence of God, especially when we haven't done that for quite a while. So in closing, I would like to go and just give you some pointers, some thoughts, just to help you. Once we've made the decision to spend more time with God, now the process on how we can do it. So I'm going to put up, ask them to put up a slide and you're welcome to take just a picture of that and I'm going to talk you through the slide which I honestly believe would help us. It's also called the first principles. And I'm thinking when I'm now in this tent and I don't know what to say to God, I'll probably feel insignificant. But when I look at this, I trust that it will help us just to facilitate the meeting, the appointment that we have with God. Number one, when I'm in his presence, it's a good thing to just declare your love to him. Matthew 2, uh, 22, 37 to 40 in the New King James. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This says to me, receive the love of God, receive his salvation, receive his forgiveness, and as you receive it, you also give it to others. Receive it, give it to others. That would be a good idea to start, point one. Then point two, seek the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. I'll read it, you know that. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's a good second point. To say that if I've received your forgiveness, your salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, then help me to get my priorities straight. If it says seek the kingdom first, all it says in, in 2022 English is help me to get my priorities straight. That's a good point number two. Number three, bind the strong man. Matthew 12 verse 29. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. Strange scripture, but the essence is be honest and say, Lord, now that you know me, 
I battle with this, I battle with that. This is a stronghold in my life. Help me tie down the stronghold that it can no longer rob or steal. Number four, seek reconciliation. We read that in Matthew 5 verse 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. The stent of meeting is going to require us to do some damage control, to revisit some stuff, to go back, to say I'm sorry, whether you're right or wrong, to reconcile. Number five, judge not. Matthew 7 verse 5. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to the remove the speck from your brother's eye. It says, God, let me not be so quick and easy to judge. Let me rather understand. I want to say to you, it's quick to judge another family or another person on decisions and things they've done. But wait until that decision lands in your family. Then it changes the whole scenario. Then you experience the love of God and then you expect people to treat you with grace, with love and compassion. And sometimes we are so rude when other people are going through tough times. We're so easy to judge and to, 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 to speak over them. I'm asking you, let's reconsider. And then the sixth one we, I, I haven't put on the slide. Another number six, first principle. It says when, when all of these basics are in place, then Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10 says, an obvious fruit of all these basics would be honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I'm going to ask the worship team just to join me. And I want us to close our eyes and just consider this word I'm going to repeat what Moses did and I want to encourage us to be not just hearers but doers this morning. Moses pitched the tent. He made a commitment to seek the presence of God. Then he said, Lord, I know that I've got a purpose in my life. I've got a mission and a commission. Help me to get there. And then, Lord, he said, help me find favor in your sight.